Thank you all so much for coming out tonight, and thank you, Christine Cousins, for inviting me for that wonderful introduction. Oh, that's great. I'm really glad to be here um, with this new book, and actually that introduction is going to save me a little time, and I'll have to set this up so much for you. Um, I'm going to try to read uh, the first chapter, which is kind of long, and so I'm going to lop off the first part of it, um, just start a little ways through and read the, the rest of the first chapter of the book. Um, so the, the story is about this boy named Caleb Vincent, um, who is 14 years old, and he has been missing for three years, so he disappeared when he was 11. Um, and at this point in the story, we, um, the circumstances are, um, remain fairly mysterious of um, what happened to him while he was gone. Um, he is not talking a whole lot, but he has come home with um, his hair buzzed very close. He's got a lot of scars. He's um, wearing glasses, which he was not wearing when he left home. Um, and one of the first things that he does is he sits down and starts playing the piano, which he did not play when he left home. Um, the, the story opens in kind of a siege situation. Um, the media is parked outside the house. Um, no one can really leave. Um, the four main characters are going to um, trade off the point of view here. So the first chapter is written in fairly short sections that um, move from one point of view to the other. <coughs> Uh, Caleb himself, um, his parents are Jeff and Marlene Vincent, um, and then he's got a younger sister whose name is Lark, and she's 11 years old. And um, there are also some FBI agents who are characters in the book. Um, who, there are two bureaus of the FBI involved. One is in Georgia. Um, they live in the suburbs of Atlanta. And Caleb was found in Washington State, so there are FBI agents based in Washington State also involved in the story. And I think that is all you need to know. Um, oh, the family has split apart in the three years that Caleb was missing for reasons that I think will become clear in what I will read, you'll pick up on them. Um, and, but they have come back together very hurriedly to, to um, make a home for Caleb to return to. Before the kids were up in the morning, Jeff folded and stowed the blankets from the front room sofa where he had slept. It wasn't to keep a secret. Marlene had told their son he could sleep in her bed anytime he liked, and she said, my bed, not ours, a maternal zone made free of men in case they might need it that way. But it seemed important that the house look as normal as possible, not just to the necessary attendants, but to the Vincents themselves. Caleb did not take his mother up on her offer, though he'd been that sort of child, a cuddly child a child of many fears. He was the boy who could not make it through a single night of summer camp, phoned crying for his parents to fetch him, and as old as eight, he would still wheedle his way into the bed between them. Now he slept in his own bed, if poorly. He was the last awake each morning, and Jeff often heard his footsteps past midnight or his low voice in the kitchen, having a late night ice cream social with Marlene, or once on the phone to Spokane and Juliana Brewer, his favorite FBI agent specialist in crimes against children. It was only about 10 o'clock out there, and Juliana had told him to call any time. Though Jeff eavesdropped longer than he should have, they were talking about nothing special, the Seattle Mariners, movies they'd seen. There was no guidebook for this. He worried Marlene was being too open with Caleb, as she'd once been with Lark, out of her own uncensorable need for something, intimacy or venting. With Lark, she had not been able to stop herself from cataloging the possible traumas Caleb could be enduring at that moment because children could never be too thoroughly warned. It had become, at least in a certain mood, her notion of responsible mothering. In her late hour kitchen chats with Caleb, Jeff overheard them trading lists of the drugs they had done. Marlene saying, mostly cocaine, methamphetamine, and sleeping pills. What I really want most of all right now, though, is a drink. Caleb's voice, harder to catch. I don't like meth too much. Roofies are nice, the most pills, the sedative kind, and liquor. A pause, and he added, beer, I like beer. Oh yeah, Marlene said, the smile in it unmistakable. I could go for a beer. Mostly I was drinking what I called a lazy martini, just gin over ice. It's hard to get the energy to mix things or stock extras when you're drinking alone. And also, I was very busy looking for you every minute you were gone. Marlene, a believer in the inherent value of communication, had stumbled upon this method and urged Jeff to try it. 
if you're alone with him and very quiet, and just speak. But like he's a grown-up, you know, like a friend, he'll talk. But Jeff was less sure. Why not value silence? Let him alone and let him heal. He was home. If the FBI seemed satisfied with their working theory of what had happened, thin on suspects and ragged as it was, why should his parents press for more? Most of the day, Jeff worked from the basement office because they were supposed to give Caleb space. That mantra in his head, less reminder to himself than unvoiced argument to Marlene. He drove Mark to and from school. He ate meals with whoever was present, dinner generally the only time. They were all four gathered around the table and unattended by relatives or foundation volunteers or agents of the FBI. Once a day, Marlene accused him of going quiet again, but he was just trying to be mindful, to take it all in, stay on top of it. More than anything, he was trying still to hear the news that his reasonably dead and married son was in fact alive. It didn't compute. Caleb was gone before him stood Caleb, and so much time had passed. Jeff found himself unable to put the two together. Marlene was supposed to be in rehab. Only because he'd had to track her down in a hurry to let her know that there was news of Caleb had he learned she'd enrolled herself in an outpatient program a few weeks prior. Now she claimed she didn't need it. Not that she was recovered, more like she'd never really had a problem. Let me tell you about addicts, okay? She said, hissing in the relative remove of the front hall. And I've met my share, even before I started up with that group therapy, whatever. Half of them are just idiots with no self-control. The others are people with real reasons for using that can't be fixed, who had horrible things happen to them that can't be undone. But me, I'm a special case. I was one of them, but my horrible thing was undone. There is no precedent for me. Is that what your doctors say? More or less. Marlene had been addic addicted to her own anguish, to the internet at 2 a.m., to the endless search. Jeff was willing to concede that the drugs had been mostly the facilitators to being awake for it or knocking herself back down. But he knew the first mandate of rehab was be asleep at night and awake during the day. And he wasn't sure she was accomplishing that with much more success than their son. Caleb was not addicted anymore, if he ever had been. He'd been found living in a small town an hour outside of Spokane with a doctor, a man he called Jolly. Jolly, he said, had taken him away from the man who kidnapped him. Jolly had gotten him off the drugs. They've called a piano tuner because nobody plays the piano in the house until now. The piano tuner said, there must be a fire out there or something. I was like, geez, what's going on? I had to park down the street. It was a busy day at the Vincent house. The therapist, a pleasantly toadish woman with yellow and gray hair commissioned by the FBI, was down in the basement with Caleb, who really could not be taken out to meet her at her office. Mitch Abernathy, the agent in charge of Caleb's case, was having coffee in the kitchen with Marlene. He said, maybe I could sneak him out to the field office. We could play racquetball or something. Marlene smiled. It was hard not to get a little giddy, borderline amorous every time she looked at Mitch. For three years, four months, and 14 days, he, more than Jeff, had been the man in her life, loved, hated, endured. She, his special tormentor, called at all hours, hurled abuse as she pleased, turned shamelessly sweet to seduce from him information and pointless effort. He dog-trained her to behave and learn patience. After everyone else had given up, even the Find Caleb Foundation forced toward repurposing its resources, it had been only the two of them struggling on. Mitch using any spare time to scour databases with their thin evidence. There had never been much. Caleb's BMX bike hidden in the woods behind the elementary school. A connection to a sketchy neighbor. A sighting with a strange man. None of it fruitful. Eight months on, they found internet photographs. Blurred horrors, including a boy clear enough to call Caleb. Photos Marlene would not have been shown, but that she raged until Mitch relented. That linked to an ongoing investigation, but as Mitch insisted, could have been taken at any time, and in any case did not offer much hope for what they called a live recovery. After that, nothing of note. When the FBI released the bike from the evidence locker, Mitch brought it back to the house on Waverly Way, where Marlene was living alone, and hung it on the garage wall for her beside Jeff's large, her own. Now it was as if, after all that frustration and sorrow and suppressed wrath, she and Mitch had fallen into a coat closet and had some kind of glorious planet-rocking sex. Probably they had wanted each other more than once through all that time, 
every emotion so intensified by the fact of a missing child that it bled to adjacent ones, lingering over their coffee in post-coital paradise. They both felt the impending end. What would be left to them without the source of all that energy? When the piano tuner finished, Marlene wrote him a check. He said, oh man, you're those people with the kidnapped kid, right? I should have known. I must be dumb, dumb or something. Well, so what's it like? He must be going crazy knowing he was walking around loose like that and didn't tell no one, right? All but the first sentence was blocked by Mitch's intervening, dark-suited body, moving the man to the door without violence or effort with his new love. Thanks for the service, friend, he said. We really appreciate it. Before they had boarded a plane, the plane together for Spokane, Mitch had advised the Vincents not to concern themselves with this itchy question, the million dollar why. Over pizza and champagne the night the DNA results came back, he said, though they had not asked. It's really not all that surprising or something to dwell on too much. He was either terrified of Lundy or he felt like he owed him for getting him out of the first, for getting him out of the first place. I don't have any doubt he was every bit the captive there. He was made to feel like he had no choice. But no one had asked Caleb the question. What about Caleb? Lark asked. She'd been reporting for them the, on, the goings on at Agape this for private school over Sunday pancakes, a week, one week to the day from his return. Where will he go to school? Lark, Lark by the way, is sort of obsessed with her brother. She's, um, she's very interested in figuring out who he is now. Jeff looked at Marlene, who chewed a piece of bacon. Over her usual damp-eyed, vague anxiety lay a film of bliss he felt at least partly responsible for. Sex for the first time in a year, the first in three that had not put her into a temper at herself or at, hi at him. She'd always been the sexual one in the relationship. He a little in awe of a woman he had to work to keep up with. But the abduction, not just the loss, but the apparent nature of it, had, without diminishing her drive, touched all sex with something rancid. Now she watched the quiet, now he watched the quiet in her rooms, hoping she'd stay willing to forego reserving the bed for Caleb, with the world peeping through the blinds. Step one toward completing the restoration of his family. He wondered, though, how long it might go on being more hers than his, she the de facto head of the household and parent of their son because she had won their all in bed. Caleb won't be going to school for a while, she said. I won't, Caleb asked. All of them turned to her with the same questioning eyes. It was one of those topics that had not, not yet come up. I can't let you just yet, honey. I'll have to figure something out, maybe homeschooling. Caleb tightened and kept quiet. Lark drew a breath on his behalf, but waited also. Marlene said, you see how it is out there. If you go out, I can't keep it from you. And I don't mean just the cameras. Every kid in your classes, every teacher, every parent, I don't want those people making us follow you forever. Hard to argue with, and no one, least of all Jeff, was inclined to try. His decision to leave her the year before, to take Lark, had underscored the general assessment that her tenacity over Caleb indicated mental imbalance. She might, if she might forgive him for it one day, she would not now, if ever again, be questioned. Maybe Jeff said, if we find the right private school, it wouldn't be so bad. Kids there have to get used to differences. Marlene shook her head, unhearing. Even if he moved, she muttered. I like school, Caleb said quietly to no one. They all stopped chewing. He so rarely spoke. He almost never made a request or offered these droplets of information, each bursting on impact into a little scene. They knew, everyone knew, that for two whole months he'd been a freshman in a public high school in Providence, Washington. He'd ridden the bus, sat in class each day, had friends, and he had liked school. Maybe his liking school in the first place, wanting to go, was the reason he'd been enrolled in it. Jeff swallowed, sliced another bite of stacked pancake. Was he the only one who heard defiance in that sentence, the insistent I of it? I am no one you know. I lived without you. I lived while you buried me, and it's too late now for you to know who I am. Or what kind of father was he resenting his son for taking his son away? 
Marlene rose in a casual way with a butter dish and stopped behind Caleb's chair to lay a hand on his head, set her lips to his forehead at the hairline. We'll think of something, I promise. For as long as a meditative pause allowed, she stroked his bristly hair. But for now, until Christmas at least. Beth Ann is Marlene's sister. Um, fair warning, Beth Ann said, unpacking groceries into Marlene's pantry. I think Mama's going on TV. Marlene, unsurprised, said, you are fucking kidding me. <laughs> I told you you should have let her come over. Their mother, according to Beth Ann's theory, was angry about being excluded from the house and having most of her calls ignored. But Marlene was certain that whatever the woman said on TV would only be worse if she had insider information to back it up. Her mother's latest voicemail. I want to make sure you're watching him around Lark. You know how they are for a thing like this, and you have to accept he's going to be messed up in the head. Fourteen is plenty old to be a danger to little girls, and you know we can take Lark out here with us anytime. This might have counted as an improvement over her previous assumption, equally damning that Caleb would turn out to be gay, except that all of what her mother considered sexual vices could be lumped together as committable by the same person, and everyone fell into one of two categories, the untouched and the guilty. Marlene would never forgive her for saying once, three years before, at the first hint of molestation, that maybe it was for the best, after all, if he were dead. He knew the rooster over the doorway. There's a stained glass, stained glass rooster over the doorway. Um, the one he named, named Doodle Doo when he was four. But the house it guarded was smaller, his room shrunken, its beds, his bed's edges closing in, more every night as if he were growing by the minute. He lay on his back in Caleb's bed, impersonating Caleb, eyes closed, then open because the door was shut so they couldn't peek in to check if he was still there, if he looked like Caleb yet. Through the bathroom they shared slept his sister. He remembered having one there, the dance of locked and unlocked doors. Amid all the houses shrinking, she alone had grown from a doll girl into a person. Of them all, she was the most changed, though still younger than him. So he trusted her to be more herself and not a trick. His parents, in certain glimpses, could seem like very good copies of themselves, planted by aliens or evil government interests. Outside in the carpeted hall, footsteps, his mother's, crossed back and forth, a pause at each pass to listen to him. Shoulders aching, he held the horizontal shape of Caleb, a boy who should be asleep by now. It seemed as if he'd be required to endure this, endure this posture only a short time, a couple of weeks, as if being himself in this place could be no more than temporary. When he was little, he'd seen a Disney movie about a cream-colored horse with two owners. A poor boy who called the horse Taffy had lost it to a rich girl who called it Beau. It's a real movie. No one? <laughs> <laughs> Whose horse was it? To decide the matter, the boy and girl stood at opposite ends of a paddock and called the horse, one calling Taffy and one calling Beau. And the whole town watched, expecting the horse to know which one it was. The blinds kept out most of the light, and he woke late in the morning, glad to feel the day half gone without him. The room, a blur without his glasses, was still his room, and exactly as he had left it, half of everything in it, a secret code of Haley he could no longer read. Posters for the bands she liked, a sketch she'd made of a bearded man, poems by poets only she had heard of, line drawings copied from old books of strange 19th century machinery. Haley was his babysitter a graduate student who spoke to him as if he were her own age and could follow half the loopy things she said. He tried, but the closest he could come to her was her music. Some of these leftover possessions, like the poster for a CD on the back of his door, a woman in a white nightgown on a yellow moor, running away, looking back over her shoulder as she disappeared into fog, made him almost remember the voice in the music. Though he couldn't recall a word or note, of the metacarpal's music, he felt how their eerie, gothic melodies haunted some locked up room in, in his head on an endless loop. The disappearance of Caleb Vincent could be reduced <coughs> to a very short story, and maybe he alone knew it. Once upon a time, a dim little boy fell in love with his babysitter and thought he could impress her by liking a band she liked, collecting the band's music, showing up at a concert where she would be. 
he took a shower, dressed himself in whatever new clothes had appeared in his room the day before. Downstairs, he could count on a lingering hug from his mother just for getting up, a hand on his shoulder from his father, and he was glad for these simple things. He could lean on his parents as if a child, forget for a few seconds what they were thinking. Because they were waiting for it, he forced out some words like a line in a play. He was playing himself. What would Caleb say now? But whatever he came up with, he knew, would not stop them from thinking what they were thinking about him, the hundred-headed beast of their every thought. His mother called it mooning about when he hovered from room to room, trying to think of what Caleb would say, but more often forgetting that effort, just lost in his head somewhere else. So he parked himself in the upstairs game room and noodled around on the new game cube, a present from someone who was glad he'd been found. Funny how his mother had made all these online friends, most of them parents of missing kids, who now sent to Caleb the gifts they couldn't buy for their own children, as if taking candy from strangers hadn't gotten him gone in the first place. An iPod, Nano, a phone with GPS, clothing, boxes came daily filled with things he once would have loved but that didn't interest him much now. Sometimes his parents left him alone so long that he switched from video games to the TV he wasn't supposed to watch. The war in Iraq must have been on a break because every news channel featured his 11-year-old face, his name in a printed graphic, what happened to Caleb Vincent. For a current photo, they all showed the same loop of video shot through a car window, an FBI transport that had been physically stopped momentarily in the road. Also, there was a digital snapshot taken by a classmate in Providence depicting the boy they'd known as Nick Lundy and Caleb himself had known as Nicky. Blonde, wearing glasses and half a smile, head cocked with a hint of attitude, a 14-year-old who looked absurdly content and unmanacled to be under headlines <coughs> about sex slavery and mysterious pedophile rooms, and the kidnapper had sent him to school. Caleb wondered if his parents had watched secretly, if they had by now gotten an iPhone of Nicky, the boy whose head he'd shaved into a woodland but whose glasses he still wore. Sometimes he caught a glimpse of Charles, Samson, Lundy, always the three names, as with serial killers, huddled under a jacket, out on bail, and led away by a lawyer. It was hard to see any of his face. But in the smiling portrait from his hospital ID badge, shown as often, every feature was clear, and some bleached blonde commentator would generally be on hand to express surprise or shock that this man, aside from being almost attractive, appeared so friendly, intelligent, normal, which is what the neighbors and his co-workers all confirmed as the impression he made. He was 38 years old. His eyes were lively behind wire-framed glasses, his nose a little large, his dark hair grown out over his ears, whisking around his neck. Nothing marked him. Caleb's mother was right. He shouldn't watch this. It only made him angry, guessing what other people saw in a picture or what drove them to watch. The man would be no, no, no real mystery. They knew him in advance. Caleb Vincent was the one they wanted to untangle and lay there. No one said, hey, let's break the kid all over again on national TV. But that was the footage they all wished for, the part of what happened they most hoped to reproduce. Jolly had warned him. All this hiding in the house on Waverly Way, refusing to answer questions, granted a certain protection, but only gave the news people more to wonder about, to fill the airtime with. Perhaps he cannot speak the effect of a horrible trauma. He will be this way, he will be that. He must not be blamed. He will require a sense of therapy. He may feel himself to be at fault. He may feel ashamed. He may identify with his molester, even love his molester. He would not, he would have been too terrified to leave. He could not possibly have wanted. He lay in Caleb's skin, sleepless in Caleb's bed. Pop went the lock on the door, <coughs> his sister done in the bathroom. He could slip into her room and tell ghost stories on the tall canopy bed, or he could go downstairs and find his mother in the kitchen. Usually he did one or the other. Once, choosing neither, he'd been caught crying by his mother, but he couldn't tell her why. She stroked his back, saying, I'm your mother, I'm your mother, her hair making a hot tint over him in the dark. It wasn't what she thought. None of it was what anyone thought. Mainly, he was ashamed to be the center of it all. He was ashamed of what they knew, even knowing so little, the parts too horrible to speak. And it was just hard, keeping up every minute with who he was supposed to be when he heard those voices calling two names in the dark. They were not supposed to ask him much. 
Even if they could, how much would they want to know? With him safely returned, it was as if he'd only been away at a particularly mysterious, <coughs> undisclosed atrocities. He was presumed to have endured something he should not have, though he'd come home changed by far more than this, by more than the hormones racing in his blood, stretching his bones long, hardening his eyes. He'd come home educated. Yet if he wanted to pretend none of it happened, they should let him. They should let him feel their willingness to listen, even if he waited months, years. What do you want? Marlene asked him, as safe a question as she could think to murmur at the breakfast bar after midnight when they had finished all the ice cream there was. Most of all, right now, if you could have anything. He didn't take long to decide. I want everyone to stop thinking about me all the time. The high school he would have been attending had he never gone away sent him books. The outward book was the exact one he'd been using in Providence, where a test was to have been given on chapter five the day after a pair of FBI agents had pulled him from class. It was comforting in a way to go on to chapter <coughs> six as if he'd taken the test, even if he had to forge on alone. He missed friends. Not the specific ones in Providence, he hadn't known them long as much as just people to hang out with, the pack of kids and his place in their midst. His once best friend, Patrick, still lived down the block in the same house. Patrick mows mom's lawn, Lark had blurted, forgetting she was supposed to pretend the lawn had always belonged to all of them. His mother said, yes, well, Patrick, of course he remembers you, and then tried to discourage him four or five ways that danced clear of what she wouldn't say, that even if she'd consent to letting him out of the house again ever, he would not find anyone willing to be his friend. Eventually, she'd given in, gotten on the phone with Patrick's mother, and arranged for the boys to get together at the Vincent house, maybe play video games. When Patrick had backed out at the last minute, Caleb wasn't sure Marlene hadn't preempted it somehow. And should he be mad, she had. Was it worse to be rejected or to be so protected that he never could be? Boys changed so much between 11 and 14, she told him. Maybe it was for the best. And yes, Patrick had new friends now, wild friends, and Caleb really could not be involved in all that. Juliana had given him a journal before he left Spokane, leather bound with creamy, unlined paper. Try writing down some of that stuff you're spinning up there, she said, meaning his head. Mostly he sketched. Lots of eyes, tattoos, hands, pieces of things. He wrote out some of the Latin he could remember, mixing it with made-up words, ghost words, real things, whole things scared him. He wrote, I want to kill myself, and scratched it black before he even knew if it was true. He drew a mouth with freckles all through the lips, Juliana. The media had finally given up on the house and cleared the street, though now and then an unmarked van drove past, slowly before the Vincent house, playing gawkers of all types, teenagers mostly up and pointed, their windows down, their voices loud enough to hear from inside. Solitary people parked and stared. Perverts, deviants, celebrity stalkers, sad people who had lost something and needed to sit close to joy. There was no way to guess which. The police, if not parked outside, swept through every 20 minutes to move them along. Lark tried to interest Caleb in Mario Kart as he lay on the game room floor on his back his legs bent over the sofa seat, arms outspread. His feet were laced into green Converse All-Stars that had arrived in the mail and had never touched the outdoor ground. Downstairs, their parents were having a semi-polite conversation, Marlene saying, I've been here, I'm not the one who left. They're not really fighting, Mark said. Caleb went to the window, lifted one slat of the blind. The rain had ended the last half hour of daylight backing and sculpting the clouds. There were no cars out front. On the outside of the window screen, a daddy long legs with white straight legs felt its way along with one feeler leg, longer than all the others, tapping ahead in all directions like a blind man's cane. Lark went on. The only reason dad and me left is because mom lost her mind a little while you were gone. But now she's fine. Now we'll all be together. She had given him versions of this story before, though she tried to avoid the upsetting topics. When her parents had flown out west, she and her aunt and cousins had moved all her belongings back into her, her old bedroom to make it look as if she'd never been gone. But they said she didn't need to lie to him, and under that pretext, Clark told him whatever she considered he ought to know, anything she'd be curious about herself in his place, 
though all of it was spun in this soothing, upbeat way that was natural to her. They were the stories she told herself, and she offered them to Caleb as truth. Near the stairs below, Jeff said, now hold on, I thought recovering addicts weren't supposed to make a major decision for the whole first year or something, isn't that right? And Marlene said, I'm not a recovering anything. What major decision, Lark wondered. Aloud, it might have qualified as an upsetting question. Caleb, listening also, turned abrupt, abruptly and left the room. She followed him down to the garage. He was behind the cars, and when she got to him, his BMX bike rested on the concrete floor before him. The bike, she said, staring as if it were a ghost object he'd caused to appear from the air. She knew every little thing about that bike, mainly from listening to him, nine turning ten, describe the exact one he wanted. It might have given her some kind of deja vu, except that he, looked, he was so much taller beside it. I'm going for a ride, he said. Don't tell them. You can't. No one's out there. He wheeled the bike past her to the side door that opened to the yard. It won't be long. I'll come with you. Get my bike down. He set a hand on her head, dipping his face toward hers. What are you, my keeper? Wait here. You can stall them for me if they, you can stall them for me if they notice. Then he was gone, leaving a panicky tightness in her chest. His hand on her hair had removed the option of riding him out. And it wasn't like he was a child. He was 14. But she couldn't let him leave on that bike either, the very one they had found in the woods behind the elementary school the morning after he disappeared. The only question was whether to follow him on foot or to try to get her own bike sparkled pink with a white basket and pink and white streamers untouched in three years down from the wall. <coughs> she made a try at hefting the bike, and her hand sunk into the back tire flat. Just as well, she didn't especially want to be seen on that little girl bike. Plus, she still had on her school uniform with its khaki skirt. On her way out the door, she caught sight of the blue Razor scooter, Caleb's once. He had taken it, she had taken it over. She had taken it over for a season before the party. <coughs> she grabbed it from its hook. On the street, she didn't know which way he had gone, but there was a circle the family had once ridden together on evenings in nice weather, up through the lot of the elementary school, over into the park, around the duck ponds, and back. He just wanted some air, some exercise, she was sure, though the man he called Jolly was out there somewhere, even if all the way at the opposite side of the country, and it seemed Caleb might be drawn straight to him on some kind of tractor beam, pedaling through the sky like one of those kids in E.T. Instinct aimed her toward the school, past Patrick's house where no one was about, too slowly on the pitiful wet blacktop scratch of her scooter, and she was winded fast from the slight incline of the road. Helmet, she remembered aloud, and Caleb didn't have one either, but maybe they were old enough not to need them now. It was growing dark. A black car passed, headlights on in the blue dusk, then turned around and pulled up beside her. Lark, called the man's voice from the window. Lark Vincent. She was semi-used to strangers calling her name by now. They, they um, gained some notori notoriety while Caleb was um, missing. Uh, she was semi-used to strangers calling her name, but it always terrified her. Worse than the obnoxious jokesters were the friendly ones, the ones who acted like they knew her or wanted her to think they did. Jaw set, she shoved her foot harder against the street as if she could outrun him. Then she abruptly stopped where she was. She couldn't lead some stalker creep to Caleb. It's Mitch, he said. She could barely see his face through the window, and he switched on the interior light. Agent Aber Abernathy of the FBI, <coughs> you want to see my badge? Get in the car. How are you going to get anywhere on that thing? Panting for breath, she climbed into the front seat, dragging the scooter along behind her. She tried to explain about Caleb, but the agent was already turning down a side street, headed away from the house, no faster than the speed limit. Are you watching us or something? Not really, he said, just driving by. She looked at him again with a stutter of uncertainty that she had recognized him correctly. She knew the name well, but hadn't been around him enough to be certain of the man attached to it. He said, I assume this is what you're after pointing ahead through the windshield. There was Caleb coasting around a corner, then pumping the pedals hard into a hill. Co, she cried. The car had rolled nearly to a stop at the curb. He's fine, don't worry. We'll give him some space. He put a cell phone on her thigh. Call your mother, please, before we get ourselves into an Amber Alert situation out here. <laughs> she opened the phone and turned to him with sudden curiosity. Do you like my mother or something? <laughs> he frowned twitched. 
I like all y'all. It's a star three. I can't. He blinked at her with his strange, small eyes. She remembered better now, vague and distracted looking, as if he were always a little put out. And she puffed a breath through her nose, held his gaze. I promised I wouldn't tell. And they won't even know we're gone yet. He shook his head, mouth full of in. You had a bit of your mother in you, you know that? She didn't know that, but didn't say so. Ahead of them, a red Corolla pulled out of the side street faster than it should have, with a bleat of tires, a wave of its tail. Seatbelt, kiddo, the agent said, and she clicked it into place. The car ahead peeled off down another street of the neighborhood maze, but they didn't follow, just continued on toward the park at their leisurely pace. At the park entrance, they pulled up and idled. The street lights were on, glowing in the damp pavement, illuminating the empty tennis courts under the tree shadow. A woman walked an elderly golden retriever up the path toward the exit. There were a couple of cars parked back near the bathrooms, but Lark could see no other people, no bikes. Where is he? Are we going to find him? It was hard to get too worked up, though, while seated beside a federal agent, a G-man. They sat for a minute, and the agent rolled down his window, as if to get some air, but instantly there was Caleb on a shush of tires, headed the opposite way toward home. The agent tipped his hand out, crooked two fingers, and Caleb stopped beside the window. Lark could hear him breathing hard. Agent Abernathy, he said, a greeting. Caleb, have a nice ride. Yeah, it's a little chillier than I thought, but you get warmed up. The agent smiled. <coughs> you headed home? Lark, in the dark of the car, hoped Caleb wouldn't notice she was there at all. Yeah, on my way. I just went around the block. All right, you go straight there. I'll be behind you. Through the window, Lark could see Caleb's chest heaving in his long-sleeved t-shirt, his knee cocked up by a pedal. Maybe he was making up his mind to argue about it, but then, the car coming but then a car coming toward them, crawling against the opposite curb, the Corolla, swung around and took aim. There was shouting, whooping. The car stopped in the road with its high beams on Caleb and at least two people in it hanging out of windows with cell phones. Caleb stood on the pedals to race away, but the agent was already out of the car, the bike caught by the handlebars. Another car had turned up behind them, less decisive than the first, but waiting. Before she saw him move, Caleb was at the passenger door, shoving Lark over. She had to quick undo her seatbelt, and he slammed himself in and hunkered low, wordless and watching. The agent, with the bike's handlebars gripped in one hand like a dog by the collar and his badge in the other, moved toward the Corolla from which someone said, hey man, it's just pictures, it's a free country. The second car changed its mind and slunk away. A few people had come out onto porches and into yards, leaning over the Corolla's window, the agent delivered a lecture and a threat and received no guff in return. Seconds later, the car creeping away backward to turn itself in a driveway, the agent opened the back door of his own car and hoisted in the bike. With a sigh, he settled back into the driver's seat and glanced toward the two of them, still ducked and frozen together. Getting near dinner time, isn't it? He rolled up the window, put the car in gear. Caleb started an apology as they drove toward home, and the agent said, no, don't you say a word. That right there is not a lesson anyone should have to learn. Just so you're clear on where you'd be if you'd taken off just then, because these are some goddamn yahoos who will run you flat down on the street. They think someone's going to give them a million fucking dollars for some crap off a cell phone, and that's all you are to them. The phone rang. Lark had to dig it out from under her. Marlene had said across its face. She handed it to the agent, who flipped it open and said, I got them both right here next to me. We're pulling them now. Thank you so much. Um, and I can take questions if anyone has questions. Um, I actually might say a couple of other things about this book. I don't know if you can tell by the cover of it, but it, um, it actually, most of the book takes place in the cloud forest of Costa Rica. Um, so this is the little park that's in Atlanta. And, um, and But this is also sort of why they decide they, they need to leave and go to Costa Rica. So that's what happens next. Big trip to Costa Rica. Any questions? 
Um, I did a lot of different kinds of research. Um, because of the set in Costa Rica, I had to, I took two trips to Costa Rica. I um, had actually, I got the idea for this book and I was one of those crazy people who had never been out of the country before. I never had a passport. I had to go get my first passport and take this first trip to Costa Rica and just sort of plan it myself. I had this idea of what a cloud forest was and, and sort of had to figure out how to get myself up to the cloud forest there. So I spent um, two months in Costa Rica on two separate trips, so a month each trip. Um, I went to some different parts there. Um, that was most of the research, but then I also had to do um, I have some uh, contacts in the FBI. I had to get a lot of FBI information. Um, I had some really nice uh, agents um, out based out in Washington State who were able to help me with the, the crimes against children material, especially for the book. Um, I'm sure there was a lot more too, but you, for books, you just you, there's so many random little things that you do. Um, you know, Man Martin from our program. Some of you, you all might know Man Martin also, who's a, a local author who um, taught me how to read palms at one point for the book, was palm reading scene. I had to figure out how to read palms. What yes. kind of um, personal effect did writing the story have on you? Personal effect? Hmm. Um, and it took me about five years to write the story. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a rough story to, to read and it's a rough story to tell, but I don't know that, like, I wouldn't say that writing it was tough on me. When it's your own story you're telling, I don't think you have that kind, that same kind of experience that you might when you're reading it. Or I, I think it, I had a lot of concerns while I was writing it about, like, how far I could push the material. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it sort of to me just like any other book where I'm just in these people's lives and I have to live with them for five years and I better like them pretty well and, and feel like I'm connected to them somehow. And, and um, yeah, does that kind of answer <laughs> that question? Yeah. Oh, what sort of methods do you use when you're developing your characters? Developing characters, let's see. Um, these are, my first two books um, are connected to each other. They're, they have characters in common. Um, so like for my second, not, my second book is my first novel. And for it, I felt like I knew the characters really well going in. And so this is my first book where I was starting with these characters that I had no connection to at all. I didn't know. And um, so yeah, I had to figure out who they were and, and get to know them. And I actually had a crazy method that I used for this book that I don't know if I would um, give you as advice. Um, I wouldn't give it to most people as advice. But it is, it is what I did with this book, which is I, I I knew that I mainly needed to know what had happened to Caleb when he was missing. Um, and the story really doesn't go back a whole lot into that. It just sort of leaks through with these little moments in the, in the present. Um, so I, what I did was I wrote 400 pages of backstory to this book that I knew was not going to go in it. Um, but I got to know the characters that way, especially Caleb. It was mostly Caleb's story. Um, but then I also did a little side trip, tr um, a little side trip for part of it, and went into the family's experience and got to know them a lot that way. Also, um, I think a lot of um, if you're stuck with characters, are you a writer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what? Um, mostly non. Yeah. Nonfiction. So cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, it's it's different with nonfiction. You're then you're you're having to figure out how to represent these people that you do know or how much you want to reveal about the people that you do know. Um, it's a little bit that way maybe for me just because I do get to know my characters really well before I started writing the book. Um, and I think most people don't go to the extreme of writing the 400 pages of backstory before. It's, it's really, my 400 pages is really an entire novel. It's a, it's a thriller. I could publish it as a thriller if I wanted to. Um, and, but, that, and that was, I mean, in, ended up being kind of a cheat, I guess, to, um, to uh, replicate the experience I had with my second book, where I already had a whole book written about the characters before I started writing the novel, so I kind of did the same thing with this one.
new stuff. I like looking at my old stuff and admiring, like, oh, beautiful image that I have in here. <laughs> I can just go back and revisit it and it's much easier. But, um, but I end up with, it, my book is very uncomfortably burned into my brain um, when I'm in the middle of it. Like, I would rather not know my book as well as I do. Um, more, most people, I think, would advise you to do more of the like, uncensored first draft when you just write straight. Um, it's easy to miss what you need to know if you're not going back over your old stuff often enough and making corrections and, and enhancing things and layering things up and um, getting it where it needs to be. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the Um, there are little things, in, especially in the Costa Rica material, like I throw in um, things that I experienced when I was traveling in Costa Rica. Um, the events that in, you know, there's so much of a story, it's the little things that, you know, it's the, the, um, the horse movie. No one knew that, but it's like a Disney movie um, called, I don't know, Ride a Wild Pony or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, you give a character the, the books you've read and the music you like and, um, and things like that. I tend not to write, um, well, the book that I'm working on now, my novel in progress, is kind of autobiographical. It's my most, my only autobiographical thing. Unless I'm really just inventing things for people. But as I draw on, especially for this setting here, um, draw on a lot of personal experience from Costa Rica. Yeah. Will any of these characters turn up in the next novel? Um, I love Jeff's brother Lowell. I want to know oh, yeah? what happens next. <laughs> Lowell was really fun to write. Um, Lowell was, I think, I think that I gave up on, on Jeff as a character halfway through the book and, and picked up his brother instead. His, um, he's got sort of a nerdy well um, older brother who is staying in this broken down hotel in the Continental Divide in, in the Cloud Forest of Costa Rica, Lowell. Um, so yeah, Lowell becomes the, the father figure of the book and he was he was a lot he was fun. Thank you. I would I would consider writing a book about Lowell. Um, but I have no plans to to do that. Yeah. How about your uh, four hundred page secret group of ruler? No no, you know, I had this idea that like I'd publish this book and it would instantly be this huge success like Oprah would pick it and I'd be on today's show and there would be crowds of people clamoring to, to read the prequel because you know everybody in America had read this book three times and needed something else and so then I was like well maybe I'll consider it in that case but no that, that's not happening so um, so yeah I'm, I, I don't have any plans to publish that book I actually spent a lot of time on the Prose. It's a really drafted book, but it's also kind of trashy. It's just a thriller. <laughs> so it's sort of like, it's, it doesn't interest me enough, I think, because it's in a standard, um, it's sort of a standard genre form um, where I'm very interested in what's happening for my character, but, but in terms of the, um, the structure and the way the story is put together, it's kind of like, mm -hmm. seen that before. It's a kidnapping story. <laughs> yeah. I know authors hate this kind of question, but I have a question about themes. Because your earlier novel, Stray, um, is, is similar to this novel in the sense that both novels, in both novels you explore what I would call the sort of fluid nature of sexual identity, or maybe identity broadly, but certainly yeah. sexual identity is very central to the way that you explore identity. And first of all, I just admire the way you render Caleb's very complicated emerging sense of himself, which is tied up very in complicated ways with his sense of a sexual identity. So he has a friend who's gay, who's very close with and maybe attracted to. He has a girlfriend in Costa Rica as well. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder if you would talk a little bit about how, how you, um, if, if, if it's true that you see sexual identity as much more fluid than our culture or our convention or history or tradition would suggest, and if you see that as a theme that you will continue to explore as you continue to write fiction? You know, yeah, I think so. Like, for some reason, all of my books have these, um, have a character, at least, who is fluid in some way, in some very specific way, usually. Um, 
and Caleb is 14, so he is still um, figuring things out and, and yes, has a very, very confusing um, context to draw from. Um, and yeah, I don't know, this, the, those characters just really interest me. And so I keep writing about them and I do have one in my, at least one, more than one, in my, <laughs> in my current novel in progress that I'm working on, so maybe, yeah, that's just, um, and they're, they're not characters who are similar to each other at all in their experience or in their, um, in their way of um, identifying themselves sexually, um, in identifying their sexuality. Uh, they're, but yeah, I don't know, the, those, just the variations, I think, interest me a lot, and I think that there are a lot more possible variations than we usually acknowledge. Any other questions? Yeah. This isn't really a crafty question, so I feel kind of bad going up here because I'm here. <laughs> but um, do you have an idea of what suburb of Atlanta, or like whereabouts in Atlanta? I really like suburb Atlanta. Oh, yeah, like I'm not, I think I, you know, I, this was a book where um, the setting for Atlanta, I had it picked out, but I don't know the suburbs of Atlanta very well. <laughs> Um, and it was, I think it was Duluth, like, that's what I love. I can, somebody picked it out for me, and I was like, okay, that's, that's where I'll be. Um, it's not named in the book, um, but I grew up in the suburbs, and, and um, I don't know, to me, like, Atlanta is so interesting, because I was always in the suburbs growing up, but, but we moved a lot, and lived in a lot of different suburbs, and they're all exactly the same. <laughs> so I was like, I know the suburbs, I can just throw one in. Um, they're not there very long, though, so yeah, it's not, um, there's nothing, and there's nothing real specific to like a suburb of Atlanta. Your explanation was really handy because I didn't understand from the first chapter how it correlated to the cover of the book at all. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, the cover is a little. Um, and then they go to Costa Rica. <laughs> That's what I should have called the book. And then they go to Costa Rica. Does anyone have any book? Oh, this week. Yeah. Hey. Hi. Hi. Um, Marlene seems to be a very complex character, um, and I'd actually would like to hear your thoughts on implications of motherhood. Hmm, implications of motherhood. That's, yeah, like that is, you know, thankfully I think that's something that, that um, many writers, most writers, don't have to think about. Like we can leave that to the, to the English majors and leave it to the readers <laughs> to, um, to pull out the themes and to um, implications. That's like a dissertation question. <laughs> um, implications of mother. Uh, she is troubled as a mother, yes, and um, and that is a lot of what the book deals with. But yeah, like I don't know that I come at it from with any sort of theory behind it or anything like that. I really just come out of this character who um, is a Marlene was a um, MFA art student, um, bartender, tattoos, and, and <laughs> never wanted to get married and have kids, and ended up landed in this suburban life um, where she didn't intend to be. And, um, and so that's part of, part of her um, difficulty in becoming Caleb's mother again is that um, she, she came from a place of being very unsure about whether she wanted to be a mother at all and then lost her child and, um, and did it in a way that she feels somewhat responsible for the actual losing of the child. Um, and, and that's what the journey of the book is for her, I guess, is, is uh, coming back to um, Defining herself as a mother and as a person, also as an individual. Any other questions? Yeah, this is why do you print your name in all the ways? Why what? Why do you print your name in all the ways? Mm -hmm. Like on the book. Oh, in the book. Oh, yeah. Like. Um, <laughs> I don't do that at all. Why do I, why do, why is my name in lowercase letters? Um, um, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> That's my answer. Um, the, the book is designed, 
apart for me. I'm lucky if I get a veto on a design or two. I actually veto I think, three designs for this book, and I'm still, I don't know, what do y'all think about the cover? <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still conflicted about the cover. Um, I have no idea what their, what their rationale is for making it all lowercase, but they liked that idea. Well, thank you all so much for coming out, and I'm very happy to sign up.